I'm just looking at the chart. A group of viruses um, that cause a disease called hepatitis. Uh, uh, what is hepatitis? What is hepatitis? Can I see uh, through the chart what hepatitis is? Can I see what is hepatitis? Don't tell me the viruses. I want this is a hepatitis is a disease. So tell me what hepatitis is. Is a disease. Uh, inflammation of hepatocytes, <laughs> inflammation of the liver, uh, inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the liver, inflammation of the liver. Good. So that is basically uh, what hepatitis is. Eh? Hepatitis is the invasion uh, of the liver by you know, viruses that kills the hepatocytes that leads to inflammation of, of the liver. And when the liver is, 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 is inflamed, it doesn't perform its function normally, and then you are sick. So we're going to look at uh, viral hepatitis. Uh, these are viruses that are primarily associated with the disease called hepatitis. So because uh, it's not just one virus that causes hepatitis. Can I see from uh, through the chart which viruses? Because I think we've, we've been mentioned these viruses before. Which viruses do you associate with hepatitis? Which viruses do you associate with hepatitis? Uh, yellow fever virus, uh, correct. Hepatitis B, B, C. What is B, C, Chris, Chris one? Hepatitis B. Uh, is A, correct. Um, is yellow fever, ear to my sema, yes. Is A, B, C, correct. Uh, is C, correct. Uh, is E, correct. And which other viruses? Cytomegalovirus, correct. Epstein Barr virus, correct. And so, hepatitis viruses. Um, uh, a number of them um, are associated with classical hepatitis. So we have two groups of viruses that can cause hepatitis. The first group are those viruses that when they infect you, the only disease you can get from them is hepatitis. Um, so for that reason, we call them hepatitis viruses. Uh, there's another group of viruses which whose goal is not necessarily to cause hepatitis in you, they cause other diseases, but sometimes when you get infected with these viruses, you can get hepatitis. So um, as you rightly say, um, we have six you know, classical viruses that cause hepatitis. Uh, that is hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, up to G. Um, and then we have other viruses like uh, cytomegalovirus. These are mainly herpes viruses. Eh? Cytomegalovirus, Epstein Barr virus, herpes simplex virus, yellow fever virus, and, and rubella. These viruses can also cause can also cause hepatitis. Well, however, when we go back to the six, you know viruses that are associated with classic hepatitis. These viruses can also be grouped into two. Uh, the two groups are enteric and serum hepatitis. So we have enteric hepatitis and uh, serum, serum hepatitis. Enteric hepatitis are those hepatitis viruses that are tra transmitted through fecal oral and uh, the serum viruses, hepatitis viruses, are those hepatitis viruses that are transmitted through blood and contaminated blood products. So um, enteric viruses are hepatitis A and B, and then uh, serum viruses are uh, hepatitis B, uh, C, D, and G. And so today we'll try to cover as much of these viruses as possible, but we are giving ourselves up to about 12, 12 or 15 
then we talk class because I'm sure today our brothers are from uh, brothers and sisters from the Muslim faith will be going to the mosque. So we need to visit them early so that they can go to the mosque and pray for us. So um, I want to dive in and uh, you know start now talking about uh, what happens uh, when you get infected with any of the six classical epidemic viruses. Um, so by the way, before I come here, there's, there are certain points which I, I want to go back and talk about. Um, there are two points uh, on this slide which I was almost leaving. So both enteric and serum uh, hepatitis viruses cause uh, two common diseases called acute hepatitis disease. And we're going to look at what how acute hepatitis disease presents. Um, but because acute hepatitis disease is, is, is a group of symptoms uh, which could appear because of any of the six viruses, you cannot use clinical diagnosis to say that this patient is suffering from hepatitis A or this one is suffering from hepatitis B. The only way of confirming diagnosis is through laboratory diagnosis. So that is something that I want you to remember from this slide. The second thing that I want you to remember from this slide is that although the six hepatitis viruses that we're talking about today, uh, we are saying that they cause hepatitis, it is a normal practice for viruses that when they get into your body, uh, they don't always cause disease, right? The viruses not, don't always cause, they don't always cause disease. So you can get hepatitis A, B, C, D, E, and G. Uh, they get into your body, but your body may, immune system may, we may be able to attack them and clear them without giving them opportunity to show, to, to, to damage the, the liver. And for that reason, you don't develop any sickness. So most infections with hepatitis, the six hepatitis viruses that we're talking about here today are asymptomatic. You know, there are no symptoms because the viruses, the body, your immune system is able to clear the viruses without allowing the virus to attack the liver. So I hope that point is, those two points are clear. So, um, so as I've just said, most people don't get symptoms uh, due to infection with the six hepatitis viruses, but some people do get symptoms, right? And the symptoms of, of, of acute or typical hepatitis are as shown on the screen. Number one, there is fever, usually temperatures of 37 to 39 degrees centigrade. Um, and there's also jaundice, and jaundice is the yellowing of the skin and the eye. If you look at the pictures on the right hand side of my slide, you can see that the one on top, that gentleman or the lady's eye is yellow, like yellow ways, right? Um, the gentleman on the lower side, the body looks yellow, right? So that is because um, of the infection uh, with, with hepatitis viruses. But one thing to note is that um, jaundice is not a common symptom. Only some people show symptoms with jaundice as a result of infection with hepatitis B virus. So as a, as a doctor, if someone comes to you uh, with fever, you know, very high fever between 37 to 39 degrees, um, but they don't have jaundice, but they have, you know, tenderness and pain in the upper abdomen, or they are, you know, urinating dark yellow or brown urine, and there's, there's still the color is pale, then you should, you should still suspect that this patient it could be suffering from infection with any of the six, but as far as that, that we've just talked about. So I hope we are together so far. Um, so I want us to take a look at uh, uh, 
I'm just checking your, your charts. Enteric it's a transmitted through fecal oral. Yeah? <laughs> I, why don't we have a F? I don't know. The people who have named meaning that is forgotten letter F. So that's why we don't have a F. Uh, good, good. So we can proceed. And so um, let us look, take a look at hepatitis A. Hepatitis A belongs to the enteric um, hepatitis uh, viruses. Remember, we talked about enteric viruses as two, enteric hepatitis viruses as two. We have enteric virus hepatitis A and hepatitis E. So I always like taking one example, talking about it, and then I give you an opportunity to go and read about the other, the other virus. So for this particular lecture, I have chosen to um, talk about hepatitis A, hepatitis A virus. Now, as you can see on the slide, this is the virology of hepatitis A. Um, you can see the, the, the electron micrograph, how, how this virus looks like under electron microscope. Um, this is very characteristic of, uh, you know, uh, viruses in the same family. Um, the virus is in the family of Picona viridae, and uh, earlier on, when we talked about classification of viruses, I told you that by looking at the family of certain viruses, you can easily see whether they are RNA or, or they are DNA virus. This is clearly an RNA, an RNA virus. Uh, because they are transmitted through people oral and they go through the stomach, naturally, they are non enveloped. Um, we said earlier that most uh, viruses that are able to withstand the acidic environment of the stomach are mainly the decade viruses. Um, so uh, then these are things that the RNA is single standard uh, you know, in configuration, and the viruses normally replicate in the cytoplasm of the host cell. Allow me to take one minute, one minute break to take the last one second. So let, let's continue. Um, that is enteric, uh, that is uh, virus, is transmitted through people uh, oral, uh, and uh, it can also be transmitted through. Uh, close personal contact. Uh, people who work in daycare uh, centers, uh, this is a very common thing in the West, but it's also gaining momentum. Uh, people, young people, when they get married, they get children and both of them are working and you don't have a house help, you can take your child to daycare. This is usually a, a good source of infection uh, of children with the A virus. Um, the virus can be acquired through uh, you know, eating food contaminated with uh, with the practice A virus, uh, or drinking water, which is also um, contaminated with the virus. So remember, how do this? How does food and, and water get contaminated? Uh, when you get infected with this virus, you you secrete, you pass the virus through the stool to the environment. Uh, if you have broken sewage systems, like we have. 
in some parts of uh, in Nairobi, uh, people who are having this virus could be shedding it into the sewer system. And uh, um, so <clears throat> the virus is excreted through stool and uh, it finds its way mainly in sewage, in sewer line. And the sewer line can also um, transmit the virus to the environment. Um, in Nairobi, there are places where they grow vegetables uh, using um, along Nairobi River, which is contaminated with feces. And uh, maybe people who are having this virus could uh, pass the virus into the Nairobi River and people use the water for growing vegetables and fruits. So that is how the virus is transmitted. Um, so upon infection, uh, when you acquire the virus um, through the mode of transmission that we just described, um, the incubation period is uh, about 14 to 28 days before you develop the acute uh, hepatitis uh, symptoms that we described earlier. Um, the symptoms that you present with are, you know, very uh, common to uh, uh, hepatitis virus infection, a fever, this fever, 37 to 39, you know, they have malice, you loss of appetite, and there is a bit of diarrhea, uh, nausea, abdominal discomfort, dark colored urine, and, and the jaundice. So these are symptoms which may or may not appear as they are. Um, but it is important to note two things. We talked about the jaundice earlier as one of the symptoms due to hepatitis uh, viruses. Uh, remember, we, the, there is, there is um, you know, a risk of, of, of getting, developing jaundice depending on at what age you acquired this virus. There, there, there's a risk of developing jaundice depending on when you acquired hepatitis uh, A virus. So for example, we are told that children who are less than six years, when they acquire hepatitis A virus, you know, they only have about less than 10% chance of developing jaundice. So you don't expect jaundice to be one of the you know, common symptoms associated with the hepatitis A practice a disease um, in children who are um, less than six years, who got the infection when they're less than six years. However, those who get this virus when they are above six years, above six years, 14 and, and beyond, they have about 50%, 40% chance of, uh, of, uh, of developing, of developing jaundice. So you have to be careful when you are using jaundice as a, 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 a symptom to classify a patient as having hepatitis A virus disease. The second point I wanted to you know, emphasize on here is chronic status. Um, the symptoms that we are describing here are, are acute hepatitis. Um, some hepatitis viruses, as we're going to see, um, they like you know, getting into what we call chronic condition, right? Um, what, is, what is the difference between acute and chronic? What is the difference between acute and chronic um, disease? Yes? What is the difference between acute and chronic? Can I see you on the chat? Chronic means you have had it for a long time. Kelsey, correct. Um, any other suggestion? Acute is before chronic. <laughs> chronic lasts longer. Uh, yes, that's, that's good enough. Acute means okay, acute is one that is shortly occurring. Acute is mild. Acute means sudden. 
acute is sudden. Chronic is, so I would, I'm not seeing any people responding about chronic, chronic, chronic. Okay, so that's good. So let's go back. Um, yeah. So acute disease is a disease that presents and, uh, you know, within a few days, usually um, between two to, to, to 14 days, you either recover fully or you, are die, or you die. So you present with symptoms and you only have a period of time to either recover fully or, or you die. So that's, that's an acute disease. Chronic disease, um, as I saw one of you saying, uh, normally, in most cases, it happens after the acute. So you get these symptoms, acute, acute symptoms, and then uh, the symptoms disappear, but then you have the balance in your body for a very long time, sometimes until you die. So that is what we call chronic conditions. So with the hepatitis A virus, there is no chronic condition. So I hope we remember that. Now, uh, diagnosis of hepatitis, um, again, as we said earlier, cannot be based on clinical presentation. So you cannot distinguish those symptoms I talk about based and say that this patient is suffering from hepatitis A virus infection. So diagnosis must be by laboratory diagnosis and what the, the two tests they use in the lab, one of them is called it's a, it's a serological test uh, that requires use of blood. And uh, you know, you 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 take blood and uh, test for uh, hepatitis A IgM antibody by using ELISA. The other test is using feces. Remember, the virus is shed in feces. Um, this test is called PCR, polymer chain reaction test. Um, it detects for the presence of the RNA of the virus in the stool, in the stool sample. So the combination of these laboratory tests and the symptoms is what will confirm whether a patient is having hepatitis A virus disease or not. So I think that's very important for you to know as, as a doctor. So prevention, so how do we prevent uh, ourselves from acquiring this virus? Again, because this virus is transmitted through fecal oral, uh, provision of safe drinking water um, is important. Uh, proper disposal of sewer is also very important. Uh, practicing hygiene, you know, things like hand washing before eating and, and after. Are, are important and education is also a very important tool, especially to communities um, to educate them that they need to have, you know, paid latrines if they don't have a sewer line um, uh, so that they, they don't, when they, are, when they go for the long call, they are able to go through into a paid latrine or uh, where the, if the other members of the community will not have contact with, the, with their feces. So the good news is that it's a vaccine. We have a vaccine for hepatitis A. So uh, this vaccine is mainly given to travelers. And again, um, it offers protection for, from acquiring hepatitis A, hepatitis A virus. So um, we've talked about, um, uh, we've talked about um, people who should be, I talked about uh, travelers as people should be given this vaccine. Now, it, it is it is, it's a recommendation that children under the age of one year are given that vaccine. Uh, family members or caregivers, people who are at high risk of getting this virus are also recommended to be, to be vaccinated. Uh, men who have sex with men are also recommended to have this vaccine because of the unknown sex. So they may actually acquire the virus it it is it it, it, it looks like it's through sexual transmission, but it is a, it's a matter of getting into contact with feces that is contaminated with the virus from this person who is infected. So we move on to uh, the next by hepatitis virus, and uh, I want to move to serum 
participant access. And uh, I want to use the example of serum hepatitis virus here as hepatitis B, hepatitis B virus. So I want to use uh, uh, the example of hepatitis B virus as an example of a serum hepatitis virus. So let me take one, one minute break. Break, you must have taken a breaking look at uh, you know, the pictures on the slide. There are two pictures, the one on top and the one on the lower part of the slide. Uh, but before I talk about those two pictures, it's important to note that uh, hepatitis B um, is belonging to a family of viruses called a partner viridae. A partner viridae. You can see the word DNA here is printed here very clearly. The B is a DNA virus, and uh, the DNA is very unique for this virus. The DNA is very unique for this virus. Um, if you take a look at at this, uh, are you seeing my my cursor? Are you able to see my cursor? Yes. So, what can you tell me about the 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 DNA of this virus. I want to see on the chart. So I'm talking about the DNA of the virus, the genetic. So somebody says it's partially it's incomplete, stand not complete. Stand, yes, correct. So that is that is true. Uh, if we take a look at uh, we take a look at uh, at DNAs are usually double stranded. Um, you can see this is the DNA. There is a double strand going this way, all the way. But when you reach here, right, um, there is that gap which is not double double stranded. Okay. So um, th this is. One of the unique characteristics of hepatitis B that it has a double stranded uh, DNA with a partial strand uh, component. A double stranded DNA with a partial strand um, uh, component. So that's that's one thing that I want you to pay attention to. Now, this virus also has certain antigens which I want you to pay attention to. The virus carries certain genes that calls for specific antigens of the virus. So inside here, no, no, that's, uh, let me see. The, you, let's start with the, the red, you know, oranges, the red cycles. These red cycles that surround the capsid of the virus, um, is one of the proteins um, of the hepatitis B virus, and it is called hepatitis B core, core antigen. The red cycles uh, forms one of the most important antigenic structures in this virus, and is called hepatitis B core, core antigen. That is number one. Number two, um, you see this also cycles with the hole inside at the outer part of the virus. Uh, they also form the second also uh, important uh, antigenic structure of this virus and it is called hepatitis B surface antigen. Hepatitis B surface, surface antigen. So what's the second antigen? The third antigen that these viruses do have uh, is called hepatitis. They are usually found under. You see this thing that look like a star, and under the surface antigen. Uh, this one, you can see another one here. Uh, they are usually referred to hepatitis E antigen. So we've talked about three antigens. 
We have talked about the core antigen, we talked about the surface antigen, and we talked about the E antigen. So we're going to talk about more about these antigens later. So please remember them. They have specific function they play as far as diagnosis uh, and infection of this virus is. So um, something else that I also want you to pay attention to is this structure here. Um, one second, one second. So, um, sorry. So this structure that you are seeing here, um, according to this picture that we have, they call it DNA polymerase. Um, but that is its other name. The most common name for this DNA polymerase for hepatitis B, does anyone know what it is? Huh? Does anyone know uh, what the other name for the DNA polymerase or that is found in hepatitis B is. Anyone can take a guess? Uh, DNA dependent, DNA pol, no. Another one? RT, what is RT in full? Zongo, question, please. Protein. Reverse transcriptase, correct. Ian has gotten it right. Mohammed Jibril has also gotten it right. So, good. Kefa has also gotten it right. I'm sure you're Googling. But that's okay. We are learning, right? So, this virus, it carries an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. And we're going to find, look, find out the role of, of this reverse transcriptase. Uh, in the, our next uh, subsequent slides. So remember, the reason why I'm showing you this, this diagram is for you to understand that number one, the hepatitis B virus has a double-stranded DNA with one with a portion of it which is not complete. Number two, uh, it has three antigens which are very important for diagnosis of this virus as well as infection. And number three, it carries is one enzyme which, which function is very important and we shall talk about it later, called reverse transcriptase enzyme. Which other virus also carry this reverse transcriptase enzyme? Does anyone know? Which other virus carries the same? Um, good, HIV virus also carries reverse, reverse transcriptase and uh, is, is HIV virus a DNA or an RNA virus? Is HIV a DNA or RNA? HIV, HIV is, is an RNA virus, right? But it carries the reverse transcriptase enzyme. What, what do these viruses use for this? Why, why does hepatitis B need reverse transcriptase? Does anyone know? Why does hepatitis B virus need reverse transcriptase? Anything because of the incomplete strand, correct? What does it do to the incomplete strand? So when hepatitis B virus, you know, get into the host cell, the hepatocyte, um, it releases the, uh, the DNA and the enzyme. That is what gets into the hepatocyte. Uh, for a virus to replicate, um, the, 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 if it's a DNA virus and it wants to replicate in the, in the nucleus of the host cell, 
it must have a fully double stranded DNA. So the first thing that happens during the replication of a RSV virus in a parasite is that it converts the single strand DNA into double, double strand. So that's the function of reverse transcriptase in, in the hepatitis B virus. In HIV, uh, reverse transcriptase converts HIV RNA into cDNA. It, convert, it converts the HIV RNA into cDNA. And for that reason, uh, HIV and the family of viruses from that group are the only RNA viruses that the transcription takes place in the nucleus of the host cell, just like DNA viruses. I hope that is very clear. And so, um, so let us look at some facts about, um, you know, hepatitis B virus, number one. Um, from an epidemiological point of view, we are told that, you know, about 200 million people are living with this virus chronically. Chronically means you must have gotten infected with this virus a few years ago, went through either acute, acute disease or no acute symptoms, but the virus is living with you just sitting in your body. The problem with, with that is that you are able to transmit the virus to, to other people. You may not develop symptoms, but you may transmit the virus to the other people. Later on, we shall come to find out uh, about this chronicity of hepatitis B virus. We shall talk about it much later. Uh, we also told that quite a number of people die annually, you know, due to this virus. Um, uh, it causes death mainly through causing, uh, you know, cancer. You know, this is one of the diseases caused by hepatitis B virus. It causes cancer of the cancer of the liver. And the, the last point, which is very important, that hepatitis B is one of the most commonly hostile acquired virus. It's one of the most commonly hostile acquired virus. So anyone who is working in the hospital environment must be vaccinated against hepatitis B virus because you have a high chance of acquiring, acquiring the virus. I'm sure all of you have been vaccinated against hepatitis B virus. Is that correct? So, transmission. How is this virus transmitted? Through a number of routes. Number one, blood transmission. Uh, so someone who is having the virus either in acute or chronic condition, when they give blood to uh, a, a blood recipient, the blood recipient will acquire the virus. And that's why it is mandatory that all blood that has transfused are screened for hepatitis B virus. Number two, it can be transmitted through sexual intercourse. Um, so if you have heterosexual sex, you are like you and someone who is having hepatitis B virus, you are likely to acquire this virus. It, are, it can also be transmitted vertically. Vertically means what? From mother to mother to child. And there has been three proposals at what stage during birth that this will come. So there is a thought that sometimes the transmission can occur when the fetus is still in the womb and uh, there is um, the virus passes through the, trans the placenta, through the placenta, but that is a very rare thing. Placenta makes it very difficult for viruses to pass through. Uh, most people, most, most transmission occurred during delivery when there is uh, exchange of blood between the fetus and, and the mother when they're cutting the umbilical cord. Um, then there's also the, th the thinking that mothers who are breastfeeding, who are having the breast B virus, could also transmit this virus to, they could also transmit the virus to, to, the, to the fetus, I mean, to the babies rather. And so these are three different uh, routes of transmission of uh, protest B virus from one person to another. So remember, uh, you can acquire this B virus in, as a child, 
but you can also acquire credit savers when you're an adult. So if you acquire as an, a child, you are mainly getting it because your mother is infected and the, the mother is transmitting it to you. As an adult, you can get it through sexual intercourse and through blood transfusion. Even children can also acquire FSB virus through blood transfusion. So it's important to understand that this. Now, when you get infected with FSB virus, uh, so a number of things will happen. Uh, number one, um, you know, there is the issue of uh, asymptomatic outcome of infection. Quite a number of people do not actually develop symptoms, uh, but those who do develop symptoms, the incubation period is very long. It's about 60 to 90 days, like two to three, three months is when you start developing the symptoms. Now, earlier on, we talked about jaundice as one of the uh, you know, symptoms that you, know, you can develop as uh, someone who is suffering from virus infection. And uh, when we're talking about protest A, and we said that, you know, children who are less than uh, six years old, six years, they have about 10% chance of presenting with jaundice. But those who are above six years are likely to develop jaundice. In hepatitis B, this jaundice also becomes something of interest. Um, when someone gets acute hepatitis as a result of infection of hepatitis B, um, there, is, there is also the possibility that you can develop jaundice, but it depends on when you acquire it. Those who acquire the virus when they're less than five years of age, jaundice only appear in about 10% of them. Those who acquire the virus after five years, about 50% of them are likely to develop, develop jaundice. The second thing to note, the third thing to note about hepatitis B in terms of clinical uh, outcome, uh, there's a possibility of death when you get infected with hepatitis B virus. The case fatality is about 0.5 to 1. Uh, it's 0.5 to 1. But now something else that we, we talked about in hepatitis A, and we said in, in hepatitis A, it is not there. In hepatitis B, you people develop chronic disease. Chronic disease means that you, you acquire the virus, you have undergone through acute disease, you have recovered sim, 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 according to the symptoms, you no longer have symptoms, but you still have virus in, in your body. And uh, again, here, uh, developing chronic disease is de also depends on when you acquire the virus. Developing chronic disease also depends on when you acquire this virus. So a question, here we are saying that if you acquire this virus when you are less than five years of age, you have about 90% chance of developing chronic disease. Uh, but when you acquire this virus, when you are older, uh, more than five years of age, the chances of developing chronic uh, condition is, is low, is between two to 10%. So why is this? Why are those who acquire this B virus when they're less than five years of age likely to get chronic condition? And I see the response on the chart. So why um, are children who acquire this virus, when they're less than five years of age, likely to develop chronic condition, and not adults. Adults are less likely to, to acquire the, the chronic condition. So again, your answer is right. Um, children less than five years have not developed robust immunity. The immunity is not as strong as adults. And therefore, they, when they go through the acute infection, the immune system will try to clear the virus, but because of they have a low immunity, the virus will overwhelm the immunity and the virus continue to, the virus continue to stay. And so um, that is why, you know, children who acquire this virus, then they're less than five years of age, 
are likely to develop chronic disease. Um, we also have premature mortality from chronic liver disease. Um, you can also actually, when you have a chronic disease, then actually the virus, the symptoms may actually you know, reappear as acute and you, you die, they, they cause about between 25% um, you know, death among those who are having chronic disease. So, uh, now, pathogenesis. Uh, there's a very interesting thing about pathogenesis of hepatitis B virus. Um, we know that hepatitis B virus infect which cells of the body? Which cells are infected by this virus? Yes, liver cells. What, what is the actual name of liver cells? Hepatocytes, correct. Um, so, so how does good hepatocytes? I can see everyone is right. So my next question is, how does it now kill these hepatocytes? Any, any suggestions? How does hepatitis B virus kill hepatocytes? Anybody can take a guess? Necrosis, inflammation, through tree cell activation, cell, cell lysis, necrosis, NK. Wow. All right, let's talk from there. So let me let me explain. So Earlier on, we talked about, you know, methods used by viruses to, you know, cause disease. And we look at how the virus interact with, you know, cells at the individual cell level to cause disease in humans. And we talked about things like cell lysis. We talked about things like cell transformation. Um, and those, those are some of the uh, you know, process by which virus will cause death of, of cause cells. But there are certain viruses that they actually use your immunity to kill your cells. There are viruses that uses your immunity to kill your own cells. So I hope you have seen, looking at this diagram, this is uh, an hepatocyte. Have a, kin, a, kin, have a look, a careful look, look at this cell. Um, the mem cell membrane here are very smooth. It has nucleus, and this is the cytoplasm. So it's being infected by hepatitis B virus. The virus comes in and injects the, 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 the DNA. And uh, once it is, the DNA is in here, the virus starts replicating. And during the replication, the virus produces different parts of the virus, which parts of them are never used in the assembly of the new videos. Um, but what happens is that in a patocyte, MHC class one, I hope I hope you have heard of MHC class one, major histocompatibility complex type one. The MHC class one uh, from from the from the nucleus. Um, as they, they, they move from the nucleus to the surface, uh, along the way, the, the, if this cell is infected, they will pick part of the virus and go with it to the, the surface of the cell. So what happens is, if you look at B, uh, the surface of this cell is now different from, from this one. These parts that you are seeing are MHC class one, presenting viral proteins, hepatitis virus viral proteins. So in your body, um, a cell which is infected like this one um, is not required. Your body has, a, has certain cells that specifically target to kill infected cells. And these cells are called T cell, T cytotoxic T lymphocytes. Cytotoxic T lymphocyte or CD8. 
this CD8 positive T cells, they are able to recognize infected cells by interacting with by interacting with, with MHC class one that are presenting viral antigen. So this cell will come and you know smell or get in contact with this MHC class one. And if there is a viral potent there, it then produce you know chemicals that will then kill the, the virus. I mean the this cell rather. Okay. So in this scenario, is the virus killing the cells or is the immune system killing the hepatocytes? Um, MHC stands for major histocompatibility complex. HLA, have you done? I thought you told me you did immunology before. Major histocompatibility complex. Yeah, they, they play a big role in immune response, uh, you know, in your body, working closely with T lymphocytes. Um, yeah, so uh, they, I go back to my question. So based on what I have said, what is killing the hepatocyte? Is it the hepatitis B virus itself, or it is the cytotoxic T lymphocyte? It is the toxic T lymphocyte. It is your immunity now killing, killing them, killing the cells. So that is how. So this virus, this 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 virus causes liver disease or hepatitis by, you know, inducing the immune response to kill infected hepatocytes. That is number one. Number two, hepatitis B virus causes two diseases. Uh, it causes uh, acute hepatitis, but it also causes hepatocellular carcinoma. It also causes, this HCC is called hepatocellular carcinoma. This is cancer of the, cancer of the liver. Let me take a break to get a glass of water before we go to the second last slide. One second. Are we together? Are we together so far? But this B virus causes acute hepatitis. Uh, it causes chronic hepatitis, uh, but it also causes hepatocellular carcinoma, cancer of the liver. So I've described in the previous slide how this virus causes uh, acute hepatitis. Uh, in this slide, I'm trying to show how the virus causes hepatocellular carcinoma, how it causes cancer. So on this diagram, um, this is the, your chromosome. Uh, the chromosome is found in all the cells in your body. So assuming this is, this is in the DNA of, uh, of hepatocytes. So um, when you get infected with the hepatitis B virus, um, the virus normally goes to the, to the nucleus because it has to replicate there. The virus goes to the nucleus because it has to replicate there. Um, all human cells have um, what is called cellular oncogene. I don't know whether you are seeing where my cursor is. All human cells have what is called cellular uh, oncogene. So oncogenes are the genes that have the potential to initiate signals within that particular cell for that cell now to become cancerous. You know, the cell forgets to die uh, at the end of the lifespan, but now start dividing into two and become cancerous. All the cells in your body do have these cellular oncogenes. But these cellular oncogenes are controlled by tumor suppressor proteins that are also found in, in your body. So rarely, cells don't just start becoming cancerous because they, all of them possess uh, cellular oncogenes uh, because there is a control, internal control within the cell. So what happens is that um, for hepatitis virus, if you have chronic infection, the virus will sit around this 
chromosome for, for a long time. And sometimes because they sit along near, near this chromosome for a long time, they insert their genome to become part of the, part of the chromosome. The Paredes B virus uh, DNA gets and become embedded and become part of your part of your uh, chromosome. Now, depending on where this occurs, if it occurs closer to an oncocellular oncogene, then it has the potential of activating uh, this, the, 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 this, 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 these genes to actually be start get simulated, and the cell now will start developing, developing cancer. The mechanism of doing this is called insertional mutagenesis because the, the virus inserts its genes, and because of that, it initiates signals that make the cells become, become cancerous. So I hope you have understood that. Um, so those are the two mechanisms by which Paradis B virus cause disease. Um, I want us to look, go through the last, very last company because of time. Um, the diagnosis of, of this virus. Um, so you can make diagnosis of the virus. Uh, the specimen of choice is blood. And uh, from blood, you can look for the following. As you can see on the slide, you can look for hepatitis B surface antigen, HBS AG, or you can look for antibodies, hepatitis B surface antigen, anti HBS. That's number one. Number two, you can also look for antibodies too, to core antigens. Core antigens are never found in blood, they're never released in blood. Uh, so you never find the core antigen in blood, but you can find antibodies too to core antigen. And these antibodies could be IgM and they could be IgG. That's number two. Number three, you can also, from blood specimen, you can detect hepatitis B E antigen, HBE AG, or you can also detect anti hepatitis B antigen. Anti HBE. This is all these three detection can be done using ELISA method or serological method. But we can also use a method called PCR to detect hepatitis B DNA in, in blood. So, uh, so these are these are the methods that, that we can use um, to detect the virus in uh, in in, uh, in blood. Uh, you can either do serology or you can you can use a molecular method to be able to um, to diagnose hepatitis B virus in someone who is infected. Now, I want us to take a look at uh, this slide, and I want you to give me. I want so we want to go step by step. This 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 is the second last slide, and then we are done. I know time is is getting short for our colleagues. Um, I want to take a look at this slide. What this slide is telling us is about acute hepatitis with resolution. Someone who gets hepatitis B, they develop acute disease, but then the disease will resolve after, after some months. So here is the time of infection, and this is the duration time after you get infected. So this, what we are seeing here are different antigens and antibodies of hepatitis B found in the blood at different time, at different time points. So number one, based on what you are seeing, which antigen would appear in blood as the first antigen? Which antigen would appear in blood as the first antigen? Hepatitis B surface? No. <laughs> Hepatitis B can be united properly. Hepatitis B with antigens. Correct. Victoria has written it correct. Hepatitis B surface antigen, HB, hepatitis B surface antigen, correct? 
Okay, that's good enough. So this is where when it starts. The red is this is what the It starts here about a month before you develop symptoms. You, you start producing resbisums antigen in your blood. And what happens? The, the, the amount increases and then it disappears at around six months. Remember, this is acute infection with the solution. Eh? So when it disappears, what happens? When, when surface antigen disappears, what happens at six months? And which antigen doesn't show in the, in the blood? Core antigen doesn't show in the blood. Hepatitis B core antigen doesn't show in blood. Please take note of that. Somebody's asking, what does hepatitis B E stand for? It stands for hepatitis E antigen. Hepatitis E antigen. This E, so this is hepatitis, this is E, and then antigen, right? Is, did you get it, Kelsey? Okay, so what happens with regards to, um, okay, let me explain. So you get infected, the first antigen will create surface antigen, and then it builds up and then you disappear. And when you recover, the, you no longer will have surface antigen after, after six months. We, what starts appearing after six months is antibodies to surface antigen and the surface antigen appears for the rest of your life. That is acute infection with hepatitis B, a virus. The next antigen to appear is which antigen? The next antigen to appear, which antigen is the next one to appear? Hepatitis E antigen. It's E antigen, is the next one to appear. You see this, this, this one here, it's not appearing around two months. It, it produces, but it's not produced in large amount, like some surface antigen. It also disappears after four months. And when it disappears, uh, you start developing antibodies to E antigen. And they also last for, for a long time, okay? And then finally, uh, these, these two lines, that one and this one, are antibodies to core antigen. So there is anti core antigen IgM, which is also produced in large amount in the early phases of the disease. Uh, it is present and disappears after around six, after around nine months. So when you recover, um, the antibodies, Ig, IgM will disappear after you have recovered. But when you are sick, you remember you start developing sickness between two to three months. Eh? Between this time is when you are sick, right? So it also disappears. Then the other antibody that's produced and lasts for a long time is IgG core antibody. I hope that is clear. Finally, uh, serology of hepatitis B in chronic condition. In chronic condition, uh, remember, so when you get infected with this virus, the people who develop, who end up with the disease for the rest of their lives, with the hepatitis B virus for the rest of their life. So how do you know that someone has chronic disease? Let's start with the B surface antigen, the red one. You get infected, the, the, the antigen increases, it goes up, uh, it goes down, but it never goes down completely. Remember, remember in the previous one, it disappeared, right? Then the next antigen to be produced is E, which is also produced in small amount. It, Comes and then he that one didn't disappear just the way it did in the acute infection. And then the two antibodies for core antigen are also here. We have IgM, which is produced and disappears within a very short time, as well as the IgG for core antigen, which, which appears after 
sometimes. Which antibody don't you see on this diagram? Which antibody are you not seeing on this diagram? Can I see? <laughs> On this diagram that I'm showing, which antibody was there in the previous diagram, but is not in this diagram? Antibodies to surface antigens. Antibodies to surface antigen, you never see them in chronic, in chronic hepatitis. Okay. So as we conclude, um the Surface, if you are doing diagnosis for hepatitis B virus, um, it is it, if you find surface antigen in blood of someone who, who is suspected to be having hepatitis B virus, it can it can it can tell you that this person is having active hepatitis virus, uh, but it cannot distinguish whether the the person has acute or chronic because surface antigen is found both in acute and and chronic, number one. Number two, the antibodies, the surface antigen, uh, are only found in people who have recovered. So if you do a test of someone and has an antibody surface antigen, doing that person has been infected and that person had recovered, or that person has been vaccinated and developed, developed immunity. So the presence of surface antibody surface anti uh, the antibody surface antigen is a sign of immunity to uh, the B virus uh, infection. If you find antibodies IgM antibodies to core antigen, it means that person has got acute infection, acute or recent recent infection. Mm -hmm. If you find antibodies to core antigen, IgG, it means that person has got chronic or past, past infection. The presence of E antigen indicates that the virus is actively replicating. So the person is actually in acute or chronic, chronic condition. Um, antibodies to this E antigen if you find them, it means that the virus is no longer replicating. Okay. Um, if the patient is still having antigen, it means that the, this person could be, you know, having infection with the presence B virus, but the virus has integrated itself in the into the host cell. And any PCR positive for DNA indicates that the person is having active uh, active infection. So, ladies and gentlemen, because of time. I want us to um, end this lecture at this point. Um, you know, there are, we will talk a little bit briefly about treatment. There are some treatments that are, are being offered about this virus now. Um, vaccination, we have vaccines for hepatitis B virus. As healthcare worker, I urge you to get vaccinated because you are likely to get infected. So I want to take this opportunity to thank you very much for paying attention to my lecture. I want to wish you a good Friday and the best and the good weekend ahead. Thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the afternoon. And for our Muslim brothers and sisters, pray for us as you go to the mosque. Asante Nishan and goodbye. Thank you.